Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Up in God's people, that's going to be a grassroots movement. Oh, there's so much I want to say here this morning. We're trying to change stuff from the top down, and God wants to change it from the bottom up. He wants to start with us and then families, and then we're trying to wait on the right guy to get in. I don't even get in politics because my audience is way too big. But I can tell you the kingdom is not coming from the White House. The kingdom's coming from God's house. Hallelujah. And it's coming from your house. Hallelujah. And it, you can't legislate righteousness. You can't legislate the kingdom. If you could, Moses already had the laws that didn't produce the kingdom. The kingdom doesn't come by observation. The kingdom comes because God brings heart transformation in people who are willing to begin to make some changes. I really believe there has to be a grassroots movement that begins with individuals and then families and then from there up. And so Shamgar, I think, is this guy who gets up out of bed one morning. I just want to picture this setting. I'm taking poetic liberty here. <clears throat> but he's a farmer. <clears throat> if you've ever been on a farm, I was raised on a farm when I was really young. Man, sometime Detroit, we had an old Minneapolis tractor. It wouldn't start. It was one of the crank things. We built fires under. We did okay. You know, sometimes then you'd get that thing started, then the plow would break or the cows would get out. And you're, you know, I think Shamgar might have been having one of them kind of days where the cows had gotten loose, the fence was broke, the tractor wouldn't start because he didn't have a tractor. <laughs> And then probably got in there, and Miss Shamgar had burnt the toast, and you know, it wasn't going real good, and the screen door was broke, and the hot water heater went out, one of them bad days. And he started about out of to head towards his field. And he probably looked and said, I would like to take the highway, because if I could take the highway, I could be to my farm or my field in five minutes. But because of these Philistines, that have occupied and that are robbing and, and plundering people on the highway, I've got to take the path of least resistance and I'm going to take a detour and I've got to go down this path and through the briars and across the thing. It's going to take me another hour to get across there. And he might have struggled that day to go down across that thing, to cross that stream or to cross that creek and briar burns on his legs and all kind of stuff, cattle not wanting to go plow right and something rose up in him that evening on the way after he finished on a long day and stuff wasn't going good. And he probably said to himself, I'm going to take the highway home today because this is my road. Come on, somebody. Touch your neighbor and say, this is my road. I'm tired of taking the path of least resistance and the obstacles and the enemies of my life that need to be confronted. And while he didn't have any weapon, all he had was an ox goat. He took what was in his hand and he said, this is my road. And I'm going to take the highway home today. And as he went down the highway, he came to the Philistines. And by the time he was got back home, he had killed 300 Philistines. He backed up in a cleft of a rock and took that ox goat. And by the time he was done, he was in a bloody flux and he killed 300 high Philistines. He walked through the door that night. Probably Ms. Shamgar saw him. His hair looked like it was rustled up and blood on his shirt. And come on, somebody. And he looked at her and said, you can take the highway now, honey. Hallelujah, because the highway's open. I mean, somebody has got to make a way in the wilderness for even the next generation to begin to follow some things. And what he does is he begins to open the highway because I believe there is a highway. I could preach on this one and tell you there is a straight and narrow that leads to life and the straight and narrow gate is not performance Christianity. It does not lead to heaven. The straight and narrow leads to life. That's right. Amen. Straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads not to heaven. It leads to life. Broad is the way. Wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And a lot are going in there. At, but Jesus tells them in the very next chapter that the door and the way is not performance Christianity. He says, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And if you come to me, I'll give you life and that more abundantly. The real gospel will give you back your life. But sometimes you've got to take the highway and say, this is my I got to tell you, man, I feel like preaching in here this morning because when God called me to preach, man, I got to tell you, I have preached for 45, I think 45 years now, full-time traveling ministry. And I got to tell you, when I started pioneering this word, there was no highway. It went beyond my waters. When I, I mean, when I, I, people wouldn't walk across the road to spit on you when you preached in barns or, or somebody's living room and nobody wanted to hear the gospel that's being preached now across airways. Then, hallelujah. 
And some of the, listen, I'm not trying to be arrogant, but I can just tell you there's a lot of guys that you watch on TV that buy my product, hallelujah, that have influenced. And so yeah, I'm not trying to say that to be arrogant. I'm just trying to say when I first started opening the highway, there wasn't many of them. But right now in major denominations, they're starting to make a shift towards the gospel that's beginning to bring people back to the highway. And said, so, this, this highway that we're on is a highway that will produce holiness. But rules and regulations don't produce holiness. The indwelling life of Christ and your union with him is what produces the life that flows out of you and opens the path for the next generation. I can't say how thankful I am for men like my daddy and men like your daddy who got up, come on, and pioneered a world that four generations. I thought to myself as I sat on my porch the other day, Hallelujah. You know, this this the trip we're going to Brazil is going to have high impact. And, and some of the platforms that, that I preach on, I'm not saying this to be arrogant. I'm just, you know, the, like I said, it's sometimes it, it is just kind of like almost I got to pinch myself because it's went beyond my wildest dream of how far I thought the message and the gospel would pr go. And the books that I've written have got into the hands of presidents and, and, and leaders of countries and politicians and and, and leaders and, and denominations and, and, and the shift has begun to really come to the place I had to point my, you know, most pinch myself. And I thought to myself as I was sitting on my porch the other day thinking about my dad who's passed away, my mom who passed away as well, what they would think that the church that they founded is still going on and that their grandsons and their children's children's children are still praising Jesus. I can promise you this morning, my youngest granddaughter, says she walked through the door, went to right front to the front to start to dance and praise God because she can't even wait on the music. She just wants to worship. And if you don't get it started, she's going to dance anyway. And in the middle of praise and worship last Sunday, somebody went to the altar. She's only four years old. Somebody went to the altar without any hesitation. Her and another little girl's over there, got their hands on them praying for them. You know, I had to say, the highway's open now. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I said the highway's open. Maybe it'll start with your generation because God uses ordinary people. When I think about the history that I came from and, and the, the background of our family, somebody asked me one time, I said, what is, your, what, 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 is your, what is your background, Brother House? I think they're asking, you know, what is my educational background? I said, I was a heathen. What was yours? <laughs> my grandma sold bootleg whiskey. It was, <laughs> she called it white lightning or sneaky Pete. You could burn it in the car or drink it. <laughs> Don't y'all look at me funny. You from West Virginia. <laughs> and my uncle drank a bottle of it one day and hunted squirrels for three days with a BB gun. It was some bad stuff. Hallelujah. <laughs> but Jesus interrupted grandma's <laughs> bootleg business. And now generations later, instead of being notorious in our city for criminal activity, the main spiritual influence of the city comes either from our church or my brother's church. I'm not saying that to be arrogant. I'm just trying to tell you it's because one guy, my, fa my father got up one day an alcoholic and he said, if you'll save me, I'll serve you. And he turned around 100%. And Stu's been there. When you come to our church, just about all of the kids, grandkids either go to our church or they go to my brother's church. And I think, you know what? If it didn't work for nobody else, hallelujah. What a life. Are you tracking with me? Hallelujah. I thought about then, there's, there's, there was another guy. Then the next one on the story was Deborah. I'm going to try to go through these quickly. I'm going to go all 12 of them. Deborah, it was a woman. She worked with another woman named J.L. Now, this, this to me probably is a struggle for uh, back in those days. I'm saying the culture would have probably been, if, it was, if it's difficult, it's been, you know, like I said, my pastor, I say this without embarrassment or without trying to defend. My pastor is a woman. It is my older, it's my oldest sister. She's actually younger than I am, but my sister can flat foot preach, can't she, Stu? Hallelujah. Great pastor. I have no problem. My mother was a great, my mother was a better preacher than my dad was, but she got all kinds of hate mail all the time. She'd preach and people wouldn't even sign their name to them how women shouldn't preach. And she said, well, uh, you know, you're going to have to take that with God because he's the one that called me. Hallelujah. And, you know, we get in all kinds of arguments about people miss out on the, on the blessing of God because they're looking at vessels. But God chose a woman by the name of Deborah. In other words, what I'm trying to show you is there are ordinary people who were dealing left-handed. Shamgar was a farmer. 
uh, O'Neill was a younger brother syndrome. Now we got Deborah and Jael, and they're going to lead. A, they're going to lead a victory to this king. And this king, by the name of Caesarea, this is powerful to me. He comes into the tent of Jael. Caesarea's name, by the way, means the carnal mind. So Caesarea comes into the tent of Jael, and he's thirsty, and she says, "Refresh me." So she gave him some milk. And when she gave him some milk, I could take that and develop it and tell you that milk speaks of the sincere milk of the word being exercised in the word of righteousness. And she gives him some milk and he deceased tells him, just lay down and rest here and rest a while and I'll close the tent. When that dude went to sleep, she took a nail. The Bible calls it a nail. It's probably a tent peg or something. She put that nail on that dude's head in a mallet and she drove that nail through his head, through his temples and nailed him to the ground. Hence, she nailed that dude. You say, well, how's that got anything to do with the finished work of Jesus Christ? Because the Hebrew word for nail, there's the same one they use when they nailed Jesus to the cross. So sometimes you've got to deal with your carnal mind. Come on, somebody. You've got to take the nail of the victory of Calvary, put it right on that unregenerated thought, and nail that dude. Y'all tracking with me? The next one was a guy by the name of... Uh, uh, Gideon, he was threshing wheat. He's a coward. He was the least of his father's house. He had to have several fleeces to even obey God, but he's threshing wheat and, and hiding under the wine press. Powerful story. Not going to go into the details of again, just giving you a brush stroke this morning, but this stuff could be developed into all kinds of sermons. Wheat and wine. He's threshing wheat, hiding under the wine press because the Midianites are coming to take everything he has, and so he's eking out a living with wheat and wine. When I think about wheat and wine, I think about bread and wine. And when I think about bread and wine, I can't help but think about this is my body. It was broken for you. And this cup is my blood of the new covenant. How many know what the enemy would like to do is steal what was exacted through this is my body that was broken for you. And it was, I, to me, I think where the famine has been in the land is, is for really not for bread and for fish, but for the hearing of the real word of God because a lot of stuff that's preached over American pulpits is nothing but self-help, political agendas, all kinds of stuff. And I'm telling you, we, we must get back to preaching the gospel and say, as priest of the Lord, do our job is to bring forth bread and wine. That's all Melchizedek did is he served bread and wine. This is my body. It was broken for you. And let me tell you, even in that, and I could sidetrack and really preach a whole sermon just on this guy alone, but the communion table was not to disqualify you. It was to qualify you because the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread and blessed it and gave it to the betrayer and even walked right Right over to, jo uh, to Judas, knowing he would uh, betray him, he said, this is my body. It was broken for you. He walks over to Peter, who's going to deny him before the rooster crows and say, this is my body. It was broken for you because what's on the table that you eat is what brings the deliverance to you. For except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, do you all have any life in you? And we try to get people to stay away from it when what we ought to do is offer to every rascal in the place and say, hey, if you get this in you, it's going to transform your life. So Gideon was hiding wheat and threshing it under the wine press and, and, and God began to raise him up and, and, and by the time God was finished with the, uh, Gideon, he's like, who do you, he, God shows up and says to him, hey, mighty man of valor. Gideon be like, who are you talking to, man? Hey, mighty man of valor. How many of God always speaks what he sees? You don't see yourself as mighty, but he sees you as mighty. And by the time God was finished with Gideon, Gideon took 300 men. Now, he had a church of 30,000 at one time. And then he has the Gideon revival and everybody leaves him except people who can drink water from the hand. And that'll preach too because the hand speaks of five-fold ministry. Not people who lap like a dog, but people who can drink water from the hand of real apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's what narrows the field down. But he takes 300. By the time he's finished, he takes those 300 men. Not without an Uzi, a Scud missile, a grenade. He takes them with a pitcher, a candle, and a trumpet. 
Now, see, I could, you, you know, by the time, you know, when, by the time you get to the place where you're even willing to go with 300, you're probably thinking, if I could at least have some good weapons, I'll take these 300 dudes down. But God said, I'm going to save not by many, but by a few. I'm going to start with the grassroots movement where it doesn't look like you can get any glory or credit for it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it with a pitcher. I'm going to put a light, a candle, in an earthen vessel because the gift in the treasure is in earthen vessels. And then I'm going to give a trumpet, and when you blow that trumpet, it's going to break that outer shell, and the light that's inside is going to come out, and it's going to scare the enemy to death. When I look at all, you know, in the years I've been in ministry, I used to think, you know, back especially in the days when I was preaching on stuff about being, you know, just about holiness being so much about performance, and I thought, you know, even when I was preaching, I was thinking, you know, I'm not even living this myself, but I'm probably somebody is somewhere. So probably these well-known guys and all this, you know, glow-in-the-dark preachers, they all, you know, they're living it. So, you know, maybe they're somebody somewhere. And then you get behind the scenes and you realize they're just as messed up as you are. Oh, you all looking at me funny. I'm just trying to be real transparent here this morning. What I'm trying to tell you is there are struggles in people's lives. From this pulpit to the door, we were talking about a friend we had uh, recently that had passed away several years ago and and after they passed away found out some things that was going on in their life and think yet yet you, you cannot deny God used them I mean know what I'm talking about God ever used you when you felt like you were probably a rascal let me just tell you we need to sound a trumpet hallelujah and keep blowing a ram's horn long and loud a ram's horn comes from the death of a male lamb and you preach a message through the finished work and it starts to bring changes in your life. The next guy was about a guy by the name of Tola. His name means a worm. He was the son of Pew and his grandfather's name was Dodo. This kid got picked on in school. Your name means a worm. Your daddy's name means Pew <laughs> and your grandpa's name is Dodo. J.R., had 30 sons. They all rode donkeys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut through some of these. I want to get to one more, and then I'm going to quit. Samson was one I really wanted to say a few things about, and then I'm going to get out your road here this morning. I was on the phone with the bishop uh, a couple of weeks ago, where this all, all came from, and, and uh, uh, he was talking to me about some things that was going on in his church and where are we at and why do we not see God seeming to move? It seems like that what we used to, he's an older bishop and he said, you know, we used to see more miracles than we did. We used to see more demonstration. And man, I, I was praying with him because he was going through some physical problems himself. And when I got off the phone with him, the Holy Spirit spoke to me as clear prophetically. And I mean, it literally was booming in my spirit. He said to me, the Holy Spirit said to me, Call that bishop back and tell him Samson's hair is starting to grow. Samson's hair is growing back. I said, Lord, what are you saying? He said, Samson is a picture of people who have laid their head in the lap of a harlot system of religion until the harlot system of religion has gouged out our eyes and we have no vision and no purpose and we're being abused and mocked and made fun of. How many know sometimes the church has become a laughing stock? Are y'all hearing where I'm coming from? And the secret of Samson's strength was not in the length of his hair. The strength of Samson was the covenant that was the Nazarite vow that a razor wouldn't come on his head. And the Lord said to me, Tell my people there's a return to covenant coming. Hallelujah. There's a return to the right covenant. And tell them that when the hair is grow, as we begin to shift and go back and return to the right covenant, the hair is going to grow back and the strength is coming back to the church where they're not going to be made fun of. And you're going to put your hands on the pillars of a system, of a world system, and shake it to the core with a gospel message. Come on, that says there's a new covenant on the planet. And the one thing that, that, that Samson did was he said to the Philistines, I'm going to give you a riddle. And if you can solve this three-day riddle, I'll tell you the secret of my strength. And this, the riddle was this, there is sweetness 
their, 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 their sweetness in the eater. That was, and he said, I'm going to give you three days to figure that out. And that riddle came from the story where Samson had found this lion, and when the lion had died, it was full of honey, and there was a honeycomb, and he dipped in there and got honey from this, this, this lion's carcass. And he said, I'm going to give you three days to figure out the riddle. And if you can figure out the riddle, I'm going to tell you the secret of my strength. Can I tell you that what the secret to that riddle is, everything Jesus did in three days and three nights. He's the lion. He's the king. And the death of a king produces promised land stuff. There's sweetness in the eater. And if we can get a revelation to the finished work of Jesus Christ and dip into that revelation, we'll start to feed on honey and the riddle will be solved and the strength will come back. What I'm telling you is the whole book of Judges is about executing the finished work of Jesus Christ and it is about demonstrating and manifesting what happens after the death of of Yeshua or Jesus, Joshua, it's about bringing that. And every one of these stories could be developed into a far greater, you know, maybe understanding of that. But I think I've said enough this morning to kind of give you the gist of what's happening here. Let me say this as well. As I look through this, all of the stuff that they did had unordinary weapons and tools, a nail, an ox goad, the jawbone of an ass. Are y'all tracking with me? And the Lord said this to me. He said, tell my people I'm going to use ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Can I get this worship team to come back and get ready to do that song you did in the middle of the one about the dry bones because it kind of has some stuff about, you know, seeing past your weaknesses and your failures. Because I think sometimes what happens to us is we we feel like Gideon, I'm the least of my father's house, or how can God use me? And uh, I, I can't tell you how many times I've walked on the platform and thought I'm the most disqualified person here, but see, it's not about me anymore. It's not about you, it's about him. It's about taking what he put. And, and, and so, you know, and then, so we, we, then we look and we say, well, you're, you're, you're talking to preachers and you're talking to people. No, I'm talking about ordinary people. I'm talking about farmers. I'm talking about sheep herders. I'm talking about mothers who are stay-at-home mothers. I'm talking about the Deborahs and the JLs. I'm talking about ordinary people. Because when Gideon got to ready to defeat the Midianites, the enemy saw a vision of Gideon as one loaf of bread, one body rolling down a hill, destroying the enemy. I think when we come together and we collectively bring whatever our gifts, our talents are, we see breakthroughs. Are y'all tracking with me? And the Lord just said this to me. I just feel like this is prophetic a little bit this morning. If, if Shamgar used an ox goad, if, 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 if JL used a nail, probably what you're supposed to use is already in your hand. And it'll probably be something you like to do. You know, when you find something people like to do and put them in that, They'll excel at it when they're doing something they are not called to do. They won't do. And so, you know, I can remember growing up, people said to me, well, if you, if you like fishing, man, you need to give it up because that's your idol. God wants you to just lay that on the altar and give it up. If you've got a boat, you need to sell it. If you like music, you need to quit. And all that stuff, we, we rob people of it. I thought, man, I heard the Lord say, say I don't want them to get rid of their boat. Somebody ought to say amen to that. I don't want them to get rid of their guitar or their music. I want them to use it for the kingdom. And I said, you know what? Maybe you don't have a preaching ministry or a television platform to preach from or a Bible school you can teach at. But you really are a hunter and a fisherman. Maybe you ought to take that boat and find a kid that don't have a dad and take him fishing and pour into his life because that might be your road. Come on, somebody. Because that's the kind of stuff that's going to shift our culture. Maybe you ought to teach a kid how to hunt. Because I think sometimes what we've done is we let a generation be literally brainwashed by what they keep on watching on television and some of the stuff and, and programmed by stuff that's being taught to them in school. And they need somebody to mentor them that's got a boat or a fishing pole. Come on, some or a youth camp or or, 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 or you say, well, I don't have that. I, I got a hammer and a saw. Well, maybe you ought to go across the street and help the little lady that's on a fixed income fix the step that she can't afford to fix. 
Maybe it's just walking across the road to that elderly neighbor and shoveling her driveway or his driveway or sitting down having a cup of coffee with them because they're just lonely. Come on, somebody. I'm talking about this is my road. I'm talking about how to change the world. But we want something grand and glorious or a magic wand or some power shift like a Superman to go boom. But we don't really realize it's right in front of us. And what happened with every one of these, they got to the point where they said, I have had enough. Come on, stand on your feet all over this building. I'm tired of the enemy plundering. My pastor preached last week, I believe it was, and she said, what Pharaoh needs is a midwife crisis. Midwife crisis. So what is a midwife crisis? It's women who stand up and say, you can't have my baby. How many know Pharaoh wanted the midwives to kill the male babies? I think what God is looking for is parents and moms and dads because we're living in a culture where grandparents are raising children. Y'all, y'all help me preach a little bit in here this morning. And we need a midwife crisis where we stand up and say, you can't have my babies. You can't have my family. You can't have my children. You can't have it. I tell the enemy, I've got a two-edged sword in my hand. I've got a, come on, I've got the high praises of God in my mouth and a two-edged sword in my hand, and I'm going to execute some judgment. I'm going to cast the check on the promises of God that are yes and amen, not just to me, but to me and my house. Hallelujah. Well, I'm the least of my father's house. When I look at my qualifications, I told Stu last night if I knew I was going to affect this many people, I'd have paid more attention in school. <laughs> if you're a school teacher, man, I got to take my hat off to you. Hallelujah. If you're a stay at home mom or dad, in the case of my two boys, they're both pastoring, but they're stay at home dads because their wives are both doctors. So that's just a good deal, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, I got to tell you, man, they can cook. They, 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 they're good with their kids. I'm, come on, somebody. I mean, you can change the world by what's in front of you. Sometimes we're looking for a mission field in Africa or some other country when it's right in our own house or neighborhood. And sometimes you just got to get up and say, that's enough. I'm taking the highway. I'm going to execute the judgment. I'm, uh, hallelujah. And I'm going to cash in by speaking this word, and I'm going to let the high praises of God be in my mouth. Let's go ahead and sing that with you. Hallelujah. I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.